Okay, great. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Jamie Haddock to give today's one word seminar. In fact, this is our first one word seminar this semester. Dr. Haddock is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at Harvey College. Before that, she received her PhD in the graduate group in applied mathematics at the University of California, Davis, and was a CAM assistant professor at UCLA. Her research focus on uh, focuses are in the mathematic mathematical data science optimization and applied convex geometry. She is actively working on randomized numerical linear algebra, combinatorial methods for convex optimization, tensor decomposition for topic modeling, network consensus and the rank ranking problems, and the community detection on graphs and the hypergraphs. And your turn, Jamie. Awesome. Thank you, Longshu. Um, thanks to the organizers, it's uh, really quite an honor to be speaking um, today here. Um, I was last year one of the co-organizers of this great seminar, and I really enjoy it. So, um, so yeah, happy to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about randomized Kashmir's methods. My title has corruption, consensus, and concentration. So I'm going to say all of those words at least a few times um, in this talk. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay, so um, this talk has kind of three different focuses, right? Corruption, consensus, and concentration. And I'm going to, just to kind of help us have a focus, um, use the lens of the Kashmir's methods to kind of talk about how they are related um, to each of these things. So we'll talk about iterative methods for corrupted linear systems, um, analysis of dynamics of simple models of consensus, and uh, the concentration of error of randomized iterative methods. Okay, so let's dive in to our, our focus, our lens. So um, the cash bars methods are an incredibly popular uh, family of iterative methods for solving uh, consistent systems of linear equations and related problems. Um, this is likely not the first talk you might have seen about cash first methods. There's a lot of work being done in this area. It's not the first talk even in this seminar series um, about the cash first methods. Um, but let's just start by talking about what these methods are. Okay, so um, like I said, the cash first methods are an iterative method. Um, they iterate by projecting their previous iterate onto the solution space of some subset of equations from a consistent system of equations. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is the simplest form of the Kashmir's methods, which are uh, which project onto a single equation from the system of equations. Okay, so the, the iteration goes grab some row of your uh, system of equations, some a single equation, and then project your previous iterate onto the solution space of that sampled row. Okay, so the um, iteration has this nice closed form. Um, and what we're viewing here is the previous iterates projecting orthogonally onto the solution space of equations. Many, many equations. Um, the Kashmir's methods are primarily applicable when we have really highly overdetermined de over systems of equations, tall skinny matrices. Okay, so the Kashmir's um, family of methods, uh, there are many, many, many Kashmir's methods. Many methods are related to Kashmir's methods. And I'm going to talk in particular about one particular form of Kashmir's method that um, really uh, kind of launched a lot of the recent popularity of the Kashmir's methods. Okay, so uh, this is known as the randomized Kashmir's method. So the randomized Kashmir's method is exactly that. Kashmir's method that you just saw in the previous iteration. But now the randomization part is that the row that we're going to project onto in each iteration is sampled randomly according to this probability distribution over the rows of your uh, uh, matrix A. So the probabilities are proportional to the norm squared of uh, each of the rows. Okay. And in 2008, Stromer and Vershinin um, published this seminal work 
where they provided a really elegant analysis of this um, particular randomized Kashmars method. So if the system is consistent, we have a unique solution, and we sample rows according to this probability distribution, then the iterates of the randomized Kashmars method converge linearly in expectation, and the expected squared error, so this is the square distance between the case iterate and our solution to the system of equations, is decreasing um, in each iteration, we're decreasing at least by this factor one minus the minimum singular value of A squared over the Frobenius norm squared. Like I said, it's a really elegant analysis. If you haven't, if you happen to not have looked at this paper, it's a beautiful thing. Um, it deals with, uh, it really uses linear algebra, simple Euclidean geometry, um, and discrete probability. So it's something that I often, you know, I work with undergraduate students a lot and I often hand this paper to them. Okay, so um, this is not uh, where we're going to end. We're going to continue talking about randomized Kashmars methods. Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that, um, okay, so here, here's our, our same result, same setup. We've got this consistent system, full rank system. Um, so here's the original uh, theorem of Stromer and Vershinin. <clears throat> oh, but I changed the year for some reason. And I just wanted to highlight that, um, uh, even in the situation that you don't have a consistent system. So maybe you have instead um, a noisy system. You're not provided with the glimpse of this true right-hand side B, but maybe instead you get a, a noisy version of B, B plus E. Even in that case, the randomized cash, randomized cash marks iterates do something good. So the expected squared error is decreasing in the same rate but up to a convergence horizon. Okay, so um, the gist, the takeaway here is that randomized Kashmars has this really elegant analysis. It has good convergence properties when the uh, matrices defined in the system are well conditioned, um, when the systems are consistent, or when the systems have small noise. Okay, but the first focus is going to be understanding what happens when there are corruptions. And randomized Kashmars by itself, really all basic Kashmars methods handle corruptions extremely poorly. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about corruptions. And then this section, I'm gonna be focusing on, mainly on results from two papers. The first is a paper from 2022 with Deanna Nidell, Elisa Vedo Rebrova, and William Swartworth, we were all at UCLA a few years ago, um, and we wrote this paper, Quantile-Based Iterative Methods for Corrupted Systems of Linear Equations Together. Um, I'm also gonna mention some really recent work with Anna Ma at UC Irvine, and again, Lisa Rebrova, um, which we titled on subsampled quantile randomized Kashmars. Okay, so like I said, um, the randomized Kashmars method does really poorly when there is corruption in the system. Okay, so when I'm thinking about corruption, I'm really not thinking about noise. Noise is sort of small, kind of benign, evenly distributed um, in the right-hand side B. When I think about corruption, what I'm imagining is that a few of these equations are just wrong, like they are off, right? And the reason that the randomized Kashmars methods work so poorly in this case is that they are just blindly projecting onto um, the hyperplanes in defined by this system, right? So periodically, if you sample one of the corrupted equations, you move super far away from what might be otherwise your ideal solution, right? And many, many of the equations are giving you good information suggesting that you should uh, converge to this solution and so when you're moving away, you're really losing all of that progress that you might have made using the rest of the uncorrupted system. <clears throat> okay, so what is our problem? We want to solve a corrupted overdetermined system of equations, AX equals, equals B tilde. Um, here, some entries of B tilde have been arbitrarily corrupted from B. B is the like ideal true um, right-hand side defined by this X star solution. 
Okay, so here is AX equals B, and what's happened is that some small fraction of the entries of B have been altered. Okay, and we now have this right hand side B tilde. Okay, so many of the equations are still nice, perfect, consistent equations, but a few are just going to be off. They're going to be giving us really bad information. Okay, so B sub C, which is the difference between B tilde and B, that's these pink values, um, are going to have at most beta M non zero entries. Support no larger than beta M. Beta here is the fraction of corrupted entries. Okay, and the problem is that given knowledge of A and the corrupted measurements B tilde, we would like an algorithm to recover X star. Now there are previous approaches. There's kind of this sparsity feeling um, in this problem, which maybe reminds you in some ways of compressive sensing or L1 type problems. Um, if you are one of those people feeling that way, you are not wrong. Um, there are uh, approaches that were developed in like the error correction compressive sensing literature um, that will handle this problem. There are also iterative row action methods like the Kashmars methods um, that attempt to handle this problem. Um, for instance, the relaxation method, which fits somewhat into the form of uh, the Kashmars method, um, uh, people were developing thermal variants, trying to kind of heat up equations that they thought might be corrupted. Um, there's some work with Hildreth's algorithm. So there's, there's a lot of previous work, but really where we come in is that we wanted to use the Kashmars method, which is simple and really easy to understand geometrically, and develop variants of that method that would solve this problem. Okay. So our intuition here is to look at the residual, right? That's probably so simple that everyone's like, okay, that's, that's obvious. Um, but we're gonna use that residual to detect in each iteration suspicious candidates that we'll hopefully be able to avoid, okay? Now there was prior work, um, Deanna Needell and I in 2018 um, published some work where we suggested that you should run just simple randomized Kashmars for several iterations, that's going to approach this X star um, uh, solution, the pseudo solution, avoiding the corruptions um, most of the time, and then examine the residual and remove just the equations with the largest uh, values. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is a lot of effort first, and it will only work when there are a few corruptions because. Uh, the more corruptions, the more likely it is that you're going to end up kind of skewed way away from X star and the residual value, the magnitudes of the entries in the residual aren't going to tell you uh, helpful information about uh, corruption. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna focus on is um, some work that uh, we did in um, beginning in 2020, where we use the residual to actually just avoid overly large corrupted steps in each iteration of the Kashmars method. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you pseudocode for the method, but really what you should be thinking is just like if a sample, if one of the sampled rows looks corrupted, like seems far away um, from us, then we shouldn't project. Okay, and the method that we proposed, we called quantile RK. So this is dense, but the idea is really simple, okay? We're going to sample some values from the residual. We're gonna calculate a quantile of the residual. So, you know, you order them in order of their magnitude, and then you choose, you say, okay, I want this, you know, 75th percentile um, position. And if my sampled residual, if the residual that I'm gonna to use to project is at, at least as small as that 75th um, percentile of the residual entries I've sampled, then I do project. And otherwise, if it looks larger than that 75th percentile, then I'm not going to project, okay? So you grab some residual entries, you say, okay, if, if I have grabbed a residual entry that I'm gonna to use to project, that's larger than a lot of this, this kind of significant sample of the residual, I just don't project. Um, and if it's smaller then I do project.
Okay, and we can prove in 2020 um, a convergence theorem. Okay, so let me um, tell you all of the pieces of this kind of dense result. So let's suppose that we have a system whose measurement matrix A has sub-Gaussian isotropic rows, whose entries are centered, uh, are, have centered and bounded density functions. Okay, now if beta is smaller than some positive constant, Q is sufficiently smaller than 0 0.5, and N and M over N, so the aspect ratio and the number of columns are larger than some fixed constants, then with this high probability, the quantile RK method using Q as the quantile computed over the full residual in each iteration converges with this convergence rate. Now this should look really familiar. This says that the expected squared error is decreasing in each iteration by a factor of at least one minus, okay, here's our sigma squared, the minimum singular value of A squared over the Frobenius norm of A squared. That was what we saw in all of those other results before Stromer and Vershinen, um, but multiplied by this factor CQ. Okay, so this is really, really dense. Um, and in particular, we're making an assumption about the matrix, right? We're saying that the matrix has sub-Gaussian isotropic rows, which, you know, depending on um, where you land, you might feel like, ooh, that's really strong. And maybe you're like, whatever, that's benign. Okay, so the, the TLDR here is that if we have some incoherent matrix that is large and the number of corruptions is small and we uh, select the quantile somewhat conservatively, then quantile RK converges. Hi, excuse me, Dr. Hadak. I just had a question. I don't know if you mentioned it already. Maybe I uh, forgot, but can you give like an intuitive understanding of what beta is or is it just some... Oh. Uh, no, I'm, thank you for asking that. I want to um, remind you. So beta is the fraction of corruptions. Okay. 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 Yeah, awesome. beta is the fraction of corruptions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Hey, Jamie, can you uh, explain a little bit for the constant CQ? Like, are, like, are there some like clear relation between the constant and the Q? No, thank you. No. <laughs> so there's the, nothing, I would say there's nothing clear. There's no easy and obvious way of talking about this CQ. Um, the things that are coming that, that affect CQ are Q, but then also um, the distribution of the um, uh, entries of the matrix A um, come into play here. And um, I think that's it. But yeah, so it's, it's a, uh, the like what I can tell you is it's never going to be like super minuscule or decreasing with M or N or anything like that. Um, but it's not an easy thing to define. I see. Thank you. Yeah. And if you're like, whoa, 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 this is so dense. I'm kind of trying to speed past this because I'm going to show you that there have been some kind of improvements on this analysis. OK, but this result is nice um, on its own. Um, in particular, this convergence rate is the same order as the standard RK rate, right? The Stomer and Vershinen rate. So even though the system is corrupted, we're not losing the ability to converge um, with the same rate as a standard RK. Okay, and the second thing is that we haven't said anything about the um, corruptions themselves. We said that there could be no more than beta entries that are corrupted, but in particular, those can, those corruptions that you actually like introduce into the right-hand side B can be anything. They can be chosen adversarial, both in position and in magnitude. And so, so they can be like drastic, they can be really small, trying to confuse people. Um, they can be any way, and um, as long as we have uh, all of these assumptions satisfied, we can still converge. Okay, so um, I would say the, the main, you know, when I, in 2020 was talking about this result, the main uh, question I got was, well, <clears throat> I don't usually encounter real world systems that have a random measurement matrix. Okay? And um, Stefan Steinerberger, a year later, came in 
um, and provided an, an, a much simpler analysis um, that uh, relaxes the assumptions on the random structure of the measurement matrix A. Right, so um, all he does is he makes some mild assumptions on the conditioning of A and the submatrices of A that have at least Q minus beta M rows. So these are kind of the rows that you might consider that aren't going to be corrupted. Okay. Um, so he assumes that the conditioning of A and these submatrices that we might be working with um, is relatively nice, that Q is sufficiently large, beta is sufficiently small, and in when all of those assumptions hold, then quantile RK um, with quantile Q converges um, with, again, a rate that is recognizable. So the expected squared error of the, R, the quantile RK iterates um, decreases in each iteration by a factor of, of at least one minus a constant that depends upon A, beta, and Q. Okay, now this is not a constant coming from some random matrix assumption. Uh, this constant really just comes from um, the discrete sampling probability, the conditioning of A, and your choices of Q and beta. Okay. So this result holds for any type of system um, as long as it has sufficiently nice conditioning and you choose Q and beta correctly. Uh, Dr. Haddock, um, yeah. I had a question regarding when you say under mild assumptions on the conditioning, like how does it, so I'm assuming it's not sub-Gaussian isotropic rows anymore, right? And no, so no, yeah, no assumption of random distributions on the matrix A. It's all it's saying, all, all the, I can describe the um, assumption here. It says that mm -hmm. um, the minimum singular value squared of matrices of at least this size divided by um, the minimum singular value of the entire matrix squared has to be bounded below by a function of Q and beta. Okay, okay. Okay, so hmm. any, any type of matrix, as long as the conditioning of the submatrices and the conditioning of the matrix are sufficiently nice and they satisfy this inequality with Q and beta, you're good to go. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the question. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay, so um, uh, Steinerberger's result is is nice, and it it sort of builds um, an, an a different analysis technique that we can build off of. Okay, but um, one thing I want to highlight is both um, our result from 2020 and Steinerberger's result assumes that the uh, quantile RK is calculating the entire residual in each iteration um, to compare to, to, to calculate the quantile of. So you're calculating the entire residual, which is just um, often not possible. And even if it was possible, it's way too costly. If you're going to, going to be able to compute an entire residual, there's like other things that you can already do. Yeah. Okay, however, there's good news. QRK works when we also just subsample the residual in, in each iteration. So if you randomly grab some subset of the residual to calculate, compute quantiles of that, and then operate um, the usual QRK step just using that quantile of your subsample, you can still prove uh, convergence results. So very recent work um, with Anna Ma and Lisa Rarova, um, we prove that a subsampled quantile RK, where we're sampling the residual at a rate of fraction alpha. So we grab alpha fraction of the residual, compute the quantile on that sub residual, um, and then operate as usual using quantile RK. We can still prove um, the convergence, um, the same type of convergence result. Okay, now I'm sorry, I'm not giving you any of the details here. You can see our paper for the details, but same stuff holds. We have some requirements about the relationships between alpha, the residual um, sampling rate, Q, the quantile, beta, the corruption rate, um, and the conditioning of the matrix and submatrices. 
And if those mild assumptions hold, then we can prove uh, this convergence uh, rate holds in expectation. Okay, so I'm going to show you some um, plots. So um, let's let's actually look on the right hand side first. So on the right hand side, what you are seeing is um, the a sample mean of many iterations of um, subsampled QRK runs. So I run like a hundred. Uh, different independent trials of SQRK with sampling rate one. So this is just QRK, sampling rate 0 0.5. So I'm sampling only half of the residual, computing only half the residual in each iteration, and then computing only 15% of the residual in each iteration. And you're seeing the squared error in each iteration versus uh, iteration index. Okay. And um, I want you to note that the behavior, the empirical behavior of the method um, is nearly identical, right? So there's no difference. There's really no reason not to subsample the residual because um, per iteration, we're seeing identical behavior. Now the bounds, the bounds weaken slightly. Um, we can't prove as tight of a theoretical bound when we have a, a small subsample of the residual. Um, just because uh, there's many more ways that bad stuff can happen. Okay, now on the right-hand side, what I'm plotting is um, the behavior of the error, but versus actual wall clock time. So each of these, you know, iterations, when I'm calculating a different size residual in each of the iterations, it's taking a different length time. And so um, here we're seeing that the behavior of the small subsampled residual quanti quantile RK is much faster than when you're having to compute the entire residual in each iteration, right? And the bounds um, that we provide when we plot them again versus the same wall clock time um, kind of track the behavior of the um, the methods a little bit closer. Okay, um, if there is a, a question about this section, I can take it, otherwise I'll move on to section two. I have a good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I assume that uh, some point, if you decrease alpha more and more, it becomes worse. Yes. Uh, yes. Do you have any intuition or something to say about that? Um, oh, the, the very good question. So what I can say is that we have run experiments where we decrease the um, sample rate um, drastically. We even go into the scenario where you're sampling just a fixed number of um, residual entries per iteration, like, you know, 5, 10, 50. Um, and there, for, for values that are kind of, I don't know, sufficiently large, and we don't know where sufficient is, we still see like behavior, it's just quite noisy. Um, we see decreasing um, error behavior. It's just a little bit more noisy than than these, um, but there is a place where where things stop converging, where we get just you know you're too frequently sampling a corrupted equation, and we don't know where that kind of transition between behaviors is. Um, and right now, one of the questions we'd really like to focus on is when you're not sampling like a fraction of your residual, but just a, a fixed number of entries of the residual, can we, in that small sample case, provide an analysis technique? Um, so that's ongoing work. That's a, a great question. Thank you. Uh, for the simulation, your beta corruption rate here is 10 to negative four. Have you tried, say, if beta increased, and your alpha is still small, it, does it also have this kind of same results? 
Yes, we have. So um, what I can say is that even for beta fractions that are much more significant, I think we went all the way up to like um, 10 to the negative two or 10 to the negative one. Um, we're still seeing convergence um, empirically. We just can't prove that these bounds cease to be decreasing for um, for extremely, for larger betas. Um, so yeah, if you look at our paper, you'll see that um, the there's like, I think when you go up by a factor of 10, the blue line disappears off of this plot because it's actually, it doesn't satisfy the um, assumptions anymore. And then when you go up to 10 to the negative two, I think the green line disappears and only the red line perseveres. And so um, yeah, the the empirical behavior is still good, but our analysis techniques break down. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, one of the theorems, um, so so you have the needle theorem has this extra term. Yes. But then somehow it disappears when you, yes. yes. <laughs> Can you give uh, some idea? So uh, I, yeah, I, I was surprised. <laughs> Yes, yeah, no worries. Okay, so so the um, a Needle theorem for noisy, for randomized cash bars on noisy linear systems is addressing just randomized cash bars as a method. Randomized cash bars as a method doesn't care how large a step it is going to potentially take. It always projects. And that is why the um, convergence horizon appears. And actually, if you think about the convergence horizon, it depends upon the infinity norm of the error of the noise, um, which makes sense. Because like, you know, periodically you're going to sample the worst, the most noisy um, entry of your right-hand side. Um, now, these results are for quantile RK. And quantile RK is, is a method that, while similar to RK, is actually avoiding those extremely large steps. It's a, avoiding the um, steps that would move us away from the um, uh, this solution to the majority of the system. So it's both two different assumptions of the scenario. We're not dealing with noise. We're dealing with these sparse corruptions. And the method is, is tuned to address those sparse corruptions. That's why that we don't have a convergence horizon term. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, in in interest of time, I'm going to launch into section two, which is titled consensus. Um, in this paper, uh, or sorry, in this section, I'm gonna be talking mainly about results from um, our paper, Paving the Way for Consensus, Convergence of Block Gossip Algorithms, which was joint work with uh, Benjamin Jarman, who at the time was a um, PhD student at UCLA, and Chen Yap, who at the time was an undergraduate student at UCLA. Okay. Um, okay, so the problem that we'll be thinking about in this section um, is known as average consensus. So average consensus is a, um, a model dynamical system of consensus over connected groups of individuals. So the problem here is that you've got some system with interconnections between agents. The agents have particular values and your goal is that all of the agents, the nodes on your network are going to learn the average of the initial secret values that they, they hold. That's the goal. So, you know, here you've got um, a connected group of individuals who have all of these different values. And we'd like eventually for them all to hold the average of these six values, right? A very easy way to do this would be to naively say, well, okay, I will talk to all of the nodes. I will ask them for their secret value. I'll average them and then I'll spit them back out. I'll send it back to the nodes and the nodes now know the average. But the um, uh, kind of philosophy of the average consensus problem is that this is a problem that we want to solve with only local communication. So we don't want some, you know, kind of parent node talking to all of these nodes. 
um, doing this aggregation and then sending back the information. We want the aggregation to happen naturally between the nodes in the network along only edges present in the network. Okay. So this is a um, like an archetypical problem, but it has many real world applications. Um, my favorite one and the only one I'll really talk about is network clock synchronization, right? So if you have a bunch of um, computers all on the same network, it's a good idea for them to have at least very roughly the same time um, uh, held in memory. And so it, you, you can think of each computer as always holding on to their um, time, and you'd like that time to be the same across the network. And you don't want to have to be, you know, every few seconds pinging all of the nodes on your network to ask them the time they currently hold and then tell them the right time. You want them to be updating with each other so that they are always staying um, nearly synchronous. Okay. Okay. So this is the problem. And um, a well-studied family of methods for solving this problem are known as the gossip methods. Okay, so the gossip methods, we can think of again as an, an iterative family of methods. So we're gonna think of this vector CK, whose ith entry is the value that node I holds at step K, right? So CI superscript zero, is the initial kind of secret values that all of the nodes are holding, okay? And this method is truly decentralized. It's truly a local method because what happens is we sample some subset of edges from the graph and we ask the nodes on, along those edges to simply average their values. So in the next iteration, I and J, if they're connected along one of the sampled edges, will each hold the same value, which is the average of their previous. Okay, okay so here again is our kind of um, example network. And here I've um, visualized one iteration of the gossip method where we've sampled two edges, this edge between 84 and negative 17 and 60 and negative nine. And if I've done the math right, um, when they, each of these nodes average along these edges, they'll hold values 33.5 and 25.5. Okay. And we will just repeat this process over and over again. We activate edges, ask the nodes across those edges to update and move on. Okay, now block gossip methods, exact same idea. Now we're activating um, groups of edges in every iteration. And we're asking not just that the nodes average along individual edges, but that the connected components defined by our subset of edges that we sample average. Okay, so, so I'll give you examples. The first example is identical to the one before. So I could grab two single edges, right? So the connected components um, of the graph that I just sub subsampled is this pair of nodes connected by an edge and this pair of nodes connected by the edge. And when I ask the nodes to, to average along their connected components, will they just average along those edges again? Okay, two more examples. So in this example, the connected component, the subgraph that I sample is this path, right? Between the nodes that were previously negative 17, 0 0.1 and 1.9, when I ask the nodes along this connected component to average, right, they're averaging negative 17 plus 0 0.1 plus 1.9 divided by three, that gives them each the value negative five. Notice that um, this path, this, if I sample this path, it's the same thing in fact as sampling this triangle, right? So the update when the sample is the triangle turns out to be the same. Okay, so these are um, gossip algorithms. And in fact, the three particular block gossip algorithms that I've shown you um, have particular names. So there is path gossip, which um, has been proposed and analyzed. There is clique gossiping, right, where we sample cliques, sub cliques of the graph. And then there is independent set gossip, where you activate um, edges that are that do not have any nodes in con uh, common, 
right? So they're always independent edge sets. They don't they don't coincide on any one node. Okay, so uh, let me present the main result from this paper. Um, so suppose that we have a connected graph and let C0 denote the initial secret values in the average consensus problem. We're gonna let C star denote the uh, vector of values we'd like them to eventually hold, which is that all of them are equal and hold the mean of C0. Okay, C bar is the mean of C0. Right, so this is where we're starting. This is where we'd like to get to. And it turns out that the randomized block gossip method iterates. So if you keep activating blocks and updating and thinking of the vector of values held by all of the nodes in the case iteration, um, with some assumptions on the allowable blocks T, will converge at least linearly in expectation, right? The expected squared error between the vector of kth node values and the average of all of the node values is decreasing in each iteration by a factor of at least one minus something I'm denoting alpha of t g. So it's a function of the blocks and it's a function of the graph. Okay, so I, I, just for um, time purposes, I'm actually just gonna skip this. Um, all I'm saying here is that this particular constant can be described in more detail for each of these uh, cases of interest, path gossip, clique gossip, and independent edge set gossip. Okay, so you might be like, whoa, 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 we started all of a sudden talking about combinatorial problems before we were talking about linear systems, like what's happening here? Okay, so um, it turns out that these methods are related to block gossip, uh, sorry, block Kashmars methods. So the block Kashmars methods are family of Kashmars methods where instead of sampling a single equation from your system of equations and projecting onto the solution space in each iteration of just one equation, Instead, you sample a group of equations in each iteration, and you project your previous iterate onto the solution space of that group of equations. Okay, So the picture is here, right? Um, here is our previous iterate x k minus 1. And in black block Kashmars, excuse me, you will project onto the solution space of a group of, of um, equations. In this case, I've sampled two equations which each have individual solution spaces here. If I was projecting onto just one of them, I'd be projecting orthogonally onto one of these two spaces. But since I'm solving both of them, I'm projecting orthogonally onto the intersection between those solution spaces. So the, in, the solution space to the group of them, which is this line, right? Black, block Kashmars projects orthogonally onto these intersections of subspaces. Okay, so the block Kashmars methods. So we have um, a theorem that analyzes the convergence of the block Kashmars methods. Okay, forgive me, I'm not going to get into the details here. Um, like, good, the you know the the assumptions here say something like um, we have some uh, least squares problem. We need some good conditioning. We need to define where we're going to be converging. Once we do all of those things, the block randomized Kashmars method with some assumptions on how we selected the blocks will converge at least linearly in expectation, right? The expected squared error is decreasing according to some um, factor up to a convergence horizon. Okay, so forgive me, but the gist is the same as all of the results we've seen before. As long as the system is sufficiently nice um, and we can uh, uh, and we sample blocks sufficiently nicely, then we'll converge at least linearly in expectation. Okay, so this is highly related to um, a paper of Deanna Needell and Joel Tropp in 2014. Um, that paper has a great title. It's, I think, paved with good intentions, uh, convergence analysis of randomized block cache marks or something like that. Um, okay, now our result 
um, is slightly generalizes their result in a few slight ways, slight but important ways. First, we relax the full column rank requirement on A. We relax the paving. They have a particular row partitioning requirement of their blocks that they're allowed to sample. And our result depends upon the minimum positive singular value of A rather than just the minimum singular value of A. Okay. Um, and the reason that we generalized this result in these three particular ways was not just to be able to prove a theorem, but it was because in order to be able to apply this result to the block gossip method for the average consensus problem, we needed um, those assumptions to go away. Okay, so every talk should contain a proof. This proof is really simple. The um, corollary follows from our convergence analysis of the block cash marks method simply because the block gossip method is a specific instance of the block cash marks method. Okay, the block gossip method is a specific instance of the block cash marks method. Okay. Now remember, block gossip is some process that's happening on a graph, right? On a graph, um, on a graph where the nodes have these specific values. Okay. But it turns out that you can describe this problem of asking all of the nodes to average their value by asking them to move um, to a value that solves a particular linear system. And that linear system is defined by what's called the edge incidence matrix of our graph. And it's just a homogeneous system, right? A homogeneous system. So really what this system QX or QC equals zero is demanding is that the value right across each of the edges, so positive value minus the other value on the other end of the edge should be equal to zero, just says that every edge should be balanced. Okay, so you take your graph problem, you turn it into a linear system, that's what we did here, and then we just point out that if you imagine block gossip happening, block gossip is grabbing subsamples of edges, which corresponds to grabbing rows of my matrix or, or equations in my system. And so block gossip, when you're doing this averaging procedure, is actually just doing block cash marks on the linear system. Okay. Longshu, how much time do I have left? Uh, you have maybe five. Five minutes? Okay. Five minutes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So here again, just some proof that um, this result truly holds. So what you're, you're seeing is we um, built an Erdos Rengi graph on 100 nodes, probability of connection 0 0.6. It turns out to be a connected graph. Um, we uh, randomly choose some initial values on the nodes, and then we just start running the block gossip method. So on this picture, we're running the block gossip method with cliques. On this side, we're running the block gossip method with independent edge sets. What you're seeing is the squared error between the iterates of the block gossip method and this average, this average um, vector um, over iteration. And when we plot our predicted bounds, the bounds that um, came from the corollary, um, you can see that it tracks it both bounds and tracks the behavior of the method. Okay, are there any questions um, about this section before I move on to our third? Okay, so in the last section, I'm gonna talk about concentration, but just very briefly. So in this section, I'm focused on very initial work 
um, with two just very brilliant and bright undergraduates um, at my college, Harvey Mudd College, um, Toby Anderson and Max Collins. Um, you should get to know these two people. They are wonderful. Um, okay, so I wanna go beyond average case analysis. So each of the results that we've seen with deals with the average error, right? I say these methods converge linearly in expectation. That in expectation part means that sometimes um, our error might not be bounded by the um, bound that we've proven. Our error can in fact deviate above it. It will just do so infrequently. Okay. So I'd like to move beyond this view of average and instead understand how the error can behave in something closer to worst case situations. Just how bad, how often can that error deviate far above the bound that we've proven? And one way to do this is to understand the concentration of the error. So does the error concentrate tightly around um, the mean, around the mean error? Okay. Okay, so a very first approach, probably the first concentration inequality that anyone might learn is Markov's inequality, right? Markov's inequality applies to non-negative random variables. Um, you need to have some understanding of the expectation. Well, hey, that's perfect for us. We have a non-negative random variable, the squared error, um, and we have an understanding of bounds on the expectation, okay? So a consequence of Markov's inequality is this bound on the concentration of the error. So if we have a consistent system, rows are sampled according to the randomized Kashmir's probability distribution, then the error of the randomized Kashmir's iterates, that's this error, deviates by greater than the lambda ab above its expectation with probability bounded above by our convergence constant to the K times the initial error squared over this value lambda, okay? Okay, so that's proposition one. The first thing that you would try is Markov's inequality and Markov's inequality does give you some, some bound. However, Markov's inequality is sort of very loose initially. And initially we have a pretty good handle on the error. The very first error is you know, given to us. It's not randomized, it's deterministic. So we'd like to tighten the initial behavior of Markov's inequality. And so what we can do is use a, a Martingale approach, utilizing Azuma's inequality and understanding the methods as Martingales, um, we can prove this um, a result. So the probability that the um, error deviates above its mean by greater than lambda is bounded above by this function of our convergence constant, our initial error, and lambda. Okay. Now, if you are better at functions than me, you might be looking at this and going, ooh, asymptotically, this might not improve upon Markov, and you're correct. But we have a conjecture that this, in fact, um, this the form of this bound is an artifact of our proof technique, and that this can be improved to this function, which is much, much better than the other function. So in my last 30 seconds, I'm just gonna show you, you can convert these concentration inequalities to confidence intervals. What you're seeing here is um, an upper bound on, um, uh, an upper bound on where I expect the error to appear uh, when I demand the probability to be at least 99%. So at least 99% of the time, or at least with probability 0.99, the error will be below each of these um, lines. So this green line is um, coming from Markov. Um, the red line, which is good initially and then gets bad, is what the proposition that we're able to prove. And the blue line is our conjecture, which you can see it actually improves upon Markov consistently. Okay, um, here what you're seeing is the mean error over 100 trials of randomized cashmars 
And this, it's not a very clear gradient, but this gradient is showing um, uh, lines below which fractions of runs have smaller error. So up here, the top line, 100% of runs had error below this top line and then decreasing as you go down. Okay, so I think I will conclude. I'm just gonna show you my future questions um, and tell you thank you so much. <laughs>